谢大家。Uh, 我中文很马马虎虎 ，so I will speak English, and we have marvelous translators、uh, who will help me out. Just give me one second to、uh, position my water and my、uh, my pointer properly. Okay. So,、um, in terms of, and we can bring the lights up a little bit,、uh, John Deet style. Thank you. Um, in terms of innovative workflow, what I'm here to talk about is the development portion of the workflow, and specifically related to virtual reality. My own、uh, background,、uh, I won't go over because、uh, Charles did a nice setup for me. But I will just say that my original background was more primarily focused on production、uh, during the first half of my career so far.、Uh, the initial 10, 12 years, in fact, I was at Disney Feature Animation with Chris Edwards for a period of time. But lately, especially after coming to China, I focused more on development, and that work in development started out in traditional areas of film and television. And、uh, as you know, I teach here at the Beijing Film Academy. But recently, in the last year, has expanded to encompass virtual reality, and virtual reality really requires a different way of thinking. I, I believe you've heard this a lot already, and there have been great comments and observations that have been made. Uh, this morning and this afternoon, on this point,、uh, not necessarily even related to virtual reality, but related to any new way of storytelling. So, for example,、uh, when Dimitri was talking about shooting at 120 frames a second in 4K, he mentioned、uh, something very obvious but easy to forget: that the director needs to think differently about how to direct. The actors need to think differently about how they perform.、Uh, everybody in the development and production and post-production chain needs to review their assumptions and adapt and, and expand upon what's possible in that new innovative environment. And, and VR is very much the same way. And it's very easy to bring your preconceptions and your old modes of thinking into play unintentionally. From the way you used to work. So, for example,、um, I, I think I'm not the first person to make this observation, but I'll make it again.、Um, virtual reality currently is very much like the early days of silent film, right?、Uh, this is the Lumiere brothers' uh, uh, train arrival, and this <laughs> this was shown at carnivals initially. You would go to sideshow carnivals and watch this train rushing at you. Audiences would run screaming from the tent. From time to time, because they thought they were going to be hit by this train, it was so real and so visceral to them. This experience was so new and, and quite frankly, frightening that the spectacle was overwhelming. And VR currently is very much still, I think, in this mode of spectacle. We talk about how how cool it is to be underwater, surrounded by killer sharks, or in outer space, blasting you know blasting aliens to death.、Um, and those experiences are valid. I'm not invalidating them. But they still fall within the realm of a spectacle, and the language of virtual reality, its own mature language, has yet to evolve. We are still speaking of it in terms of what was, games, films, television, and trying to figure out what it can be. It's very much、uh, similar to the car, right?、Uh, most of you either have cars or have been in a car, and there was a time in which the car was referred to as the horseless carriage. Right, so when the first when when、uh, Ford invented the first cars, they were referred to as horseless carriages. They were defined by what they were not. Oh, we no longer need a horse. We've got this wonderful thing called an engine now. So our carriage no longer needs a horse. It's a horseless carriage. It took decades for the horseless carriage to become the car. You think about the difference between the early Model Ts that Ford made and a Tesla. Now, both of them have a T in their name, but aside from that, they're quite different in terms of what they are. Right?、They're, the Tesla is almost like a spaceship versus、uh, the Model T, which truly was, in many respects, a horseless carriage. Very much the same with VR. VR has not yet come into its own. So、uh, this is a shot from、uh, one of Millier's productions, and Millier was an incredibly innovative filmmaker. <coughs> He was a person who was working at a time when we were just figuring out what film could do and what it could be. And you'll see, though, and this is not a knock against Millet; he's brilliant. But at the same time that he was introducing visual effects, I mean, you know, in this in this early early age, and 
these things that now have evolved into the type of technology that our, our visual effects speakers uh, have taken to you know, the nth degree, he still was very much in the space of theater, right? Much like the stage. You have a planar point of view. You know, the action is here, we're looking at it. We're not moving around with the characters. Um, and this, of course, is understandable because we're in the very early days of film, but it's typical of what we're seeing now with virtual reality that we are in much the same way that you have the, the look and feel of, of theater, of live theater, influencing film, we have the look and feel of film and the look and feel of television and the look and feel of games influencing VR. Uh, here's another example. Again, a brilliant filmmaker and performer, Charlie Chaplin, but look at the exaggeration. When you're on a stage like I am here, you need to really over-exaggerate your facial expressions in order for your emotions to read to the people sitting in the back of the room. And you see Charlie doing that here. He doesn't need to over-express as much as he may be doing here. And again, he's doing it for comic effect. This is a scene from City Lights. Um, this is actually during one of the more emotional scenes of the film when he's uh, you know, making his, uh, his emotions known to the girl. But to our eyes now, when we look at this, there's a, there's a level of over-exaggeration because the performance has not yet adapted itself, his performance, I feel, has not yet adapted itself to the realities of the new medium. And again, not a knock on Charlie uh, at all. So I have, um, through my own experience in VR, which admittedly um, is little, uh, like most people who are working in virtual reality, we are coming from other fields and now involved in this new area. I did have experience in VR back in the early 90s when I was in graduate school with virtual reality caves and so forth, but as Chris Edwards pointed out, that attempt to create an industry, to get a market for VR didn't pan out for a number of reasons that I won't uh, speak about here, but uh, can talk about later, perhaps on the panel. Um, but the cool thing is that we're taking these experiences from these other mediums and bringing it to VR, but it's incumbent upon us and we have a responsibility to adapt and evolve. So, we have to consider the point of view, as filmmakers, of what we're trying to say and through whose eyes we're trying to say it. So, this is something that any storyteller does in a book, right, on stage, in a film. Virtual reality expands the options for this. And it's important to remember that things that we consider to be natural in film, the storytelling conventions, um, montage, cutting, etc., are very unnatural. Right? There's no such thing as um, a natural experience of cinema. It's something that we have learned to accept, the conventions of film, as normal over time. And VR is much the same way. The thing about VR is that it allows us to look at things in a different way and also to flip the space. So we can use VR to augment the experience of what we're trying to say in a standard film. We can also take that space and flip it. We can scale down to a micro level, as Chris Edwards was, uh, was uh, mentioning, or expand up to a macro level. There are many different ways to think about how we are going to move through the space, what we are trying to convey, you know, as we manipulate the space in a certain way, and ultimately what experience we want the viewer to have. And I shouldn't even say the viewer, I should say the, the experiencer, the person who is immersed in this uh, scenario that we're developing. So, <laughs> This, I would not call a story. Um, this is a piece called Birdly. It's what you would uh, maybe describe as an experience, a VR experience. This, um, I've, I've tried this, it's terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. Uh, you're on a gimbal and you actually have control over this. So you can move your hands, you can flap your arms. Uh, you're a bird, basically. You're flying over New York City, flying over a simulated version of New York. And you can flap your arms to go through space. You can tilt your hands to dive, to pull out of the dive. The thing I love about this is that there's a fan blowing air in your face. This is very low tech, very low fi but also very effective in terms of just that illusion of being a bird. And it's also, I think, a great example that sometimes a very simple low fi hack is just what we need to you know, complete the convincing illusion of uh, reality, uh, in this case, virtual reality. There's also a panic button. You can't see it in this photo, but there's a little red button that you can press to cut the simulation because it's so real and so powerful that it actually gets your heart racing 
And uh, it, some people have actually, uh, there was one person I saw who almost fainted when they were writing this because it was too intense for them. So uh, this, uh, again, we've got a little bit of light spill here. This is a very fascinating piece called The Dog House. It's a Danish short film, it's 20 minutes long, but it's shot from the point of view of five different people. It's a family having dinner. Uh, and they're having a very awkward family dinner, as, as families uh, you know, occasionally do. There's a father, a mother, teenage daughter, a younger son, and a teenage daughter's boyfriend. And each person watching, you see here, this is the audience watching the film, can watch it through a different point of view. So you can watch it as the father, as the daughter, mother. I watched it both as the father and also as the teenage daughter. The fascinating thing about this is that not only do you get to watch the same 20 minutes from these different points of view, but your feeling and your empathy for those characters changes depending on who you're watching it as, who you're experiencing it through. So the first time we watched this, I was in New York um, at the Future of Storytelling uh, Summit, and <laughs> we watched this 20 minute film, and then we had a person ask, asking questions at the end. And the first question they said was, who is the main character in the film? And we all raised our hands, right? <laughs> the second question was, who is the most empathetic or understandable uh, or sympathetic character, I should say? Who is the most sympathetic character in the film? And we all raised our hands again, right? We all felt that it was us. And this might sound selfish, but it really was a powerful reminder of how and, and traditional film does this, but VR takes it to the next level. It really can be what Chris Milk uh, has called an empathy machine. It can allow us to identify um, and relate to experiences through the eyes of another person. And this can be used in fiction, as it is here, but it can also be used in documentary situations. Um, it's used by many um, charitable organizations to help people understand what it's like to have a disability, right? To be um, visually impaired in some way or to have a stroke, or maybe you can see and do things to a limited extent and to feel what that's like. Or, um, you know, to uh, visit, like if you're in the USA, to visit an abortion clinic and have somebody screaming at you that this is something you shouldn't be doing. How does that feel emotionally? Um, VR is being used in these ways that are not only for storytelling, but also for therapy. And it's this aspect, the ability to view through the eyes of another, which I think is revolutionary and is going to be uh, the truly groundbreaking aspect of this technology from the standpoint of story. Many people look at these things and they say, ah, oh, it's a gimmick, right? Flying around like a bird, that's a game, that's a gimmick. Um, viewing a short film through the eyes of, of three, four other people, that's an experiment, right? This is not really storytelling. But everything that we accept now as a convention of film or television or storytelling at one point was an experiment. And the experiments which mature, the experiments which stay with us, not only in our heads, but also in our hearts, that allow us to feel something that we didn't feel before, become the new conventions, become the new normal. Okay, uh, number two, provide immersive direction. That sounds easy, just provide immersive direction. Um, as a director, <laughs> as a traditional director, you really are kind of a dictator. Right? So if this is the audience here, these beer bottles moving along this uh, production line, you as the viewer, you may not realize it, but you're forced to, to look at, you're forced to in many ways feel what the director wants you to feel. They will cut to, let's say, a close-up of this uh, light here. You must look at this light. Now we're back to Kevin on the stage. Now we're cutting to a wide view of the audience. And you have no choice but to look at, but to absorb what the director is telling you, is insisting that you should, uh, you should do. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? But that's how the form works. This is something that when Steven Spielberg said he has misgivings about VR, he mentioned that, you know, this is a problem where people can look anywhere they want. How do I direct them, right? How do I keep them focused? Um, does the story become diffuse? Does it fall apart? In VR, you're a little more, I don't know if you can see it, but a little more like this, this diver here with this big school of fish in front of him. And you see some of the fish are trailing off to the side. Generally, he's got the school in front of him. But you have to influence, right, the audience in this situation. You can't insist that people look in one place or another. 
because they can, they can wander off in any direction they want in virtual reality. You need to use, uh, as Chris mentioned, sound cues, right, to help direct people's view before something comes into frame. Um, key elements uh, visually that can, that can focus the eye. So many people in virtual reality, many storytellers now, are incorporating not only architects uh, for the construction of the space, but also psychologists to understand how does the human mind work, how does human perception work, how can we really think more carefully about directing a person's attention through what they see, through what they feel, through what they hear. Um, this view of the fish can be used to not only represent the audience, right, in terms of a metaphor for that audience of the filmmaker, but also a metaphor for what we're filming. Many people in VR, the first thing they do is they start throwing story points in front of you, behind you, to the side of you, and you're in a VR environment, and you're looking here, and then you, you have to look back there, and then you're looking down here, and it, it just gets exhausting, right? Especially for a middle-aged person like myself. And it reminds me a lot of the early days of uh, 3D, right? Where people would have, uh, in stereo, where all the stuff was coming out at you in the screen, and everything was in your face. And, you know, of course, stereo goes back to uh, the middle of the previous century, where the spectacle of stereo was important. And it wasn't until fairly recently that people quieted down and started to actually look at the stereo space, not only in terms of what was coming out at you, but also what was receding back into the interior, right? What are we, the space that we're looking into? And especially for a quiet emotional moment in a 3D film, in a stereo film, that may be much more appropriate to that story point, to that moment, than the uh, in-your-face 3D effects, which might be more suitable for an action scene. So my point related to VR is that you don't have to have everything happening all around you at once. It's enough to be immersed in a full space, in a full 360 space, and have the focus of what you're doing more or less in front of you. If I'm going to the subway station, right, so the subway station's over there. I'm walking to the subway station. The focus of what I want to do is right here. People are walking past me. Somebody maybe comes up behind me in a cart, right? I can hear noises around me. But I'm not constantly, well, maybe in Beijing you are a little bit, looking around to make sure that there's something coming up behind me. Um, Beijing probably is an exception to that. Indeed, you, you're wise to, to look out in all directions. But you can think of it almost as like a 180 degree shell of primary information in front of you with another 180 degree shell of secondary information behind you. So if you're not looking in back of you, you're not necessarily missing anything. But if you do look behind you, you see that, ah, I'm in an environment, and just through your peripheral vision, you have the sense, much like on a very widescreen uh, uh, movie, uh, theatrical setting, that you are immersed in, in a particular setting. And immersion, ultimately, is one of the core values of uh, virtual reality. My clicker is not, ah. So this, of course, must be an organic experience. I was mentioning uh, some of Spielberg's uh, concerns about, about virtual reality. People often say, hey, wait a minute. If I'm in a situation where I can wander around or maybe uh, pursue my own storyline, we're going to fragment the experience. Right? We, will have, we will no longer have a cohesive story experience, but we will be in an environment in which the story either diffuses into nothing or fragments into a billion little splinters. And I would suggest uh, that we can look to gaming. Uh, Chris was talking about the convergence of gaming and film. I think this is one area where we can look to gaming for some solutions. If you're playing a game, those of you who play will know that there are certain key points in the game that you must go through. So if we look at this diagram here, you can imagine that those points, the white points and the black points, are key story points, key beats that we must absorb in order to understand the story and have the full story experience. But at the same time, we know that people can go over here and look at a bug if it's on the ground that they're interested in, or watch the leaves and the light coming through the leaves over on these trees here. And we want to allow people to organically explore the space, but not miss those key points. So structuring an experience and diagramming an experience in which you see for any given person, the person in red, the person in green, the person in yellow who's going through this, this story, they can veer off, you see the person in the red actually veering off quite a bit, but then being steered back through that point 
that everybody must pass through, and then going on to the next point and the next point. And this is where, for virtual reality, a lot of the work that needs to be done for development can take place on paper. Post-it notes, ordinary cue cards on the wall, to plan out the structure and the logic of the story. Sleep No More is a fantastic piece of theater that was breaking new ground in New York, and I think it just started in Shanghai, if I'm not mistaken. And this is a theatrical experience in which an entire building has been converted into an old hotel in which there are different uh, tableaus that take place, different characters, different cues, different story hints, and the audience is passing through this space. You see the audience is in the background wearing masks, so you're actually part of the experience and can go through it in any order you want. You're not restricted in terms of how you pass through the building, how long you stay in one place, what you see and what you don't, but the same things are happening in the building for every performance, and if you go through it more than once, you might have missed something, but you'll see that when you're through the next time. And people, when they're through, when they're finished with this, generally have the same understanding of what went on, but with a slightly different spin on certain details. And oftentimes, you know, friends of mine who have seen this said they spent a huge amount of time in coffee house afterwards comparing notes and talking about the story they saw and uh, how they felt about it. So at the same time, this might sound like a contradiction. I'm saying we need to be careful not to be beholden to traditional forms and previous forms of storytelling. But at the same time, there's a lot to be learned and applied by adapting those forms to uh, the new media in an intelligent and evolved way. Proximity. Please use proximity appropriately. So when we talk about an empathy machine, there's a great piece called, it's a documentary called Clouds Over Sydney, which is a VR piece produced by the United Nations on um, the uh, uh, Syrian refugee crisis. And there's a wonderful scene in which you are surrounded by these children, like who are right there. You're, you really feel like you're standing amidst this circle of children who are around you at a playground. And that's a very refreshing, uh, very touching uh, feeling to, to actually have that sense of being there, right? And, and it's powerful. People come out crying in a way that they wouldn't necessarily when they're just watching something on a TV screen or a monitor and, and looking at it like it's a thing as opposed to really being in that environment. Um, but proximity cuts both ways. If we have a horrible image, such as this, um, that, that quality of something being in your face can be very disconcerting. Because virtual reality replicates the actual environmental situation that we're accustomed to. If I have a close-up shot, such as in a, in a film, that close-up shot, which might be very acceptable on a traditional film, suddenly becomes somebody who's sitting in my lap, right, who, or who's right in my face. And that could be very disconcerting, but it can also be very charming, right? For a child to be that close to us is something we find warm and uh, we accept. So use of proximity is key. How close something is to you, why it's that close, um, is very important. And there's a, a chart here of uh, some common proximities that we experience in daily life. So the person over here on the left uh, is, let's say, myself, and I have my child next to me. So within, let's say, half a meter to a meter, we have people who are very close to us. Children, family members, loved ones, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whomever. Within about a meter, half meter to a meter, that's the general comfort zone for our friends, right? Drinking buddies, our pals, uh, people who are not necessarily related to us, but who are a very important part of our life and who we have a certain level of intimacy with. Between about a meter and four meters out are people who we work with, you know, coworkers, colleagues, etc. people who we're friendly with, but who are not necessarily uh, intimate to us. People who would not come over and help you move your couch necessarily, uh, but they'll smile at you uh, in the copy center when you're making uh, a Xerox. If anybody makes Xeroxes anymore. And then outside of that four meter range are strangers. They might be nice people, they might not, we don't know, the people who pass by us. This of course scales up or down depending on what country we're in and what culture we're in. So for example, here in China, this distance can be compressed quite a bit. You know, if I'm, I was talking about the subway, if I'm on line one and I'm standing there, I'm pressed up against some stranger who I've never met before, 
And you know, that's an experience that most people in the West don't have. Here again, though, you try to avert the gaze, right? You don't, you don't stare in that person's eyes uh, on line one too often, but you'll, uh, you'll try to look away, even if you're like smack up against uh, their backside. So this is something that, you know, to John Deeds' point, needs to be adjusted and scaled by the circumstances of the culture. We cannot say, okay, here's the way to do it, and do it that way in the US, in Iran, in, in China, um, but we need to think about the cultural norms and what's acceptable in the territory that we're making the content for. Some of these things are gonna be universal. Some are not gonna be universal. Certain things are universal, like having a child close to us or having strangers further away, but the parameter of what constitutes close or far is much different in a country like China than a country like the USA. Finally, last but not least, uh, support presence with agency. When people talk about virtual reality, they use the word presence a lot. I've, I've used it a few times myself in the last 20 minutes. Um, and that feeling of being there is great, but it can be very frustrating if it's not coupled with agency, which is the ability to actually affect change, to interact, to have something respond to you, right? Any story can have agency. A book can have a sense of agency for the reader. A traditional film can have a sense of agency for the viewer. But virtual reality really provides the opportunity for, and the expectation, quite frankly, for true agency, where you can do something and have the environment respond to you. I remember when I was visiting uh, Neutam a couple of, of weeks ago, um, I was standing in the room uh, experiencing Project Alice, and they handed me, uh, I was in virtual reality, and I was handed a bar stool, a, a, a chair. And I could see the digital bar stool in my hand, and I could also feel the, the physical bar stool in my hand. And I, I understood I was in virtual reality, I wasn't thinking that I, that I wasn't, uh, but it didn't matter. Even though I was aware I was in VR, there was this powerful connection between my brain, um, my hand, my eyes, of having something physical in my hand and seeing a digital representation of that in virtual reality. Now what happened is that I quickly got hungry. I wanted everything in the Project Alice demo to respond to me in this way. And quite honestly, not everything was set up for this. So the next demo was a Buick, right? It was a Buick showroom, a car popped up, I opened the door, and I was looking inside this virtual car, and I, I lost my balance, I started to fall in, and I went to grab the seat instinctively grab the seat with my hand. This is a, a testament to Neutam about how powerful the, the VR experience was. And, but there's no physical seat there, so I felt you know, right on my face. Uh, and I'm, I'm fine, of course, the, the HMD broke my, my fall. But the point is, is that I started to want to do everything. I wanted to be able to turn that light off and, and kick this box, and we can only do what the environment allows us to do. This issue is called the Swayze effect. You've probably heard this many times. Um, I, I always age myself by explaining this. There's a, a movie called Ghost that was made, kind of seems like it was just a couple years ago, but like what, 20, 30 years ago, something like that. Um, where <laughs> there's a lawyer named Patrick, uh, not named, but who looks like Patrick Swayze, uh, who is killed, I won't go into the details, but he comes back uh, to try to protect his girlfriend from also being killed by the same people who did him in. But he can't actually have any physical effect on the world. He's there, he can see things, he can even talk, but nobody hears him, nobody feels him, or uh, has any sense that he's there. And this is extremely frustrating for him. The only creature actually who notices him is the cat, because cats have this sixth sense and they don't care about the world, they just care about the next world apparently. So uh, the cat is able to see him, but nobody else is. And when you're in virtual reality, this can be something that is, is, is frustrating to you. You know, you, you're there and you see an animated character, and maybe they're programmed to react to you to a certain extent, but not to the full extent that you want. And, of course, that programming is something that becomes uh, time-consuming and a huge order of magnitude of work for the programmers, for the creators to uh, consider. But this is something that we, we must have, right? Human beings will not be satisfied with um, a story or an environment in VR where they can't actually be an agent of change, where they can't affect uh, their environment. I, I know that you can be clever about this. There was a, uh, there's a company that wants to do virtual reality tours of special events. So for example, 
Um, if you ever wanted to go backstage at the Oscars, right, and see what goes on with the stars as they're coming on and off the stage, you can do this in VR. And I, I, I remember laughing when I, when I heard about this. I thought, oh, and you can have the, the, uh, the same feeling of being ignored just like you would if you actually saw you know, a star in real life in that situation. Because nobody's going to respond to you or to react to you at all. And I say that semi-jokingly, but there is a way in which you can construct the VR experience to be intelligent about the fact that nothing is going to react to you. This goes back to the point of view issue in terms of how are we viewing the story, through what point of view and for what reason. But we're also going to very quickly need this, artificial intelligence. And there are many advances in AI that we've been privy to uh, in the media. Um, I have to be honest with you, through my own re initially, like many people, I thought, hmm, AI is coming and the robots are going to kill all of us. Uh, so why do we even bother doing anything? It's, it's happening very quickly. As I research it more, I realize true AI, full AI, uh, the kind of AI that will make us all slaves uh, in the future is, is way, way off. Uh, honestly, most of these so-called advances in artificial intelligence recently are not due to improvements in the science or the algorithm, but just simply due to the massive amounts of computing power that can now be applied to the same algorithms, to the same processes that we've had for 50 years. And there are books which talk about this. However, even though there are those limitations, the amount of AI that we need to apply to a virtual reality story, a virtual reality environment, is not the full, the full shebang, as uh, Ang Lee would say, but a targeted, focused amount to give us the illusion of agency, to give us the illusion of interaction for the purposes of that particular story. Right? And this is where um, we've heard that the best way to plan is the pre-planning, right? Not the sort of like hair on fire, uh, running around in post trying to patch things up. This is where the pre-planning of the virtual reality experience, the story that's being told, the way in which it's being conveyed, and the technology that's being applied uh, is, is critical. So I want to leave you with that thought and also leave you with my uh, WeChat QR code. So if anybody wants to talk about this further, I'm sorry this is kind of like a mad dash over the surface, but there's a lot more to say on this topic. Uh, I teach on it here at the school and lecture on it frequently. So um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, and I hope to have a chance to discuss it in further detail with uh, um, each and every one of you uh, soon. Thank you. Shishi.